1954. Um, the war was over in 1953, in October or September of 1953. Um, after the war was over, one of the treaties that the United States entered into, or the United Nations forces entered into with North Korea, uh, was what was called Operation Glory. Um, and that was an agreement between the two, uh, between the United Nations and North Korea, uh, that they would both return the remains of soldiers or those that had died um, in their respective lands. Um, so during that Operation Glory, the North Koreans returned the remains of around 8,000 soldiers. Um, of those soldiers, um, the United Nations or the United States tried to identify as many of the remains as they possibly could. Some of the remains were labeled. Um, and part of the difficulty was uh, typically uh, during the times of uh, deaths in war times, uh, you would have the dog tags. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the North Koreans um, just took the dog tags. When the Chinese communists uh, took over the running of the POW camps, we know that they took the dog tags, but they, we know that they kept records also. Uh, but we've never been, never had access or have never been given access to those records. Uh, so actually, the, the names of the people that had died, like in the POW camps, has always been unknown. Um, one of the things the Department of Defense does is they actively try to identify the remains, or they try to identify both those people that were in prison camps, uh, but more importantly, those that had died in the prison camp. We know that in prison camp number five, which is where Father Capon was interred, uh, that there were about 3,000 men interred in that camp. Um, of, in that camp, um, 1,600 of those, or about 65% of those people that were interred in it passed away. Um, most of them died during that first winter of 1950-1951 uh, because they froze to death because of the temperatures that were so, so harsh. And uh, so we, we have those that, were, that had died uh, in, the, in the prison camp. Uh, the burial in the prison camps um, was uh, very, uh, I, don't know, I don't know what you call it, I mean it was very arcane for what the, the, the North Koreans and the Chinese allowed the, the, the prisoners to do in burying the dead. Uh, they would never give them any implements to actually dig a grave. Um, and uh, during that winter, like I say, most of them died because of freezing to death. Um, and when they would, uh, after they w would freeze to death, they would usually just point to two or three uh, POWs and tell them to take the dead out to bury them. Uh, for, uh, or after the ground had started to freeze, it got so that the only ground that, was, uh, that they could dig into at all uh, was the ground that was along the shores of the Yalu River. Uh, the Yalu River is that border between North Korea and China. And that was the last ground that remained unfrozen uh, that they could actually dig into. So the North Koreans and Chinese made them dig out these mass graves. Um, so they would take the remains down to the, the, the mass graves to, to bury the, the dead. Um, after it got to be frozen um, there also, when somebody would die, they would just take the remains and they would have different sections or different places where they would actually stack the, the remains. Uh, one of the men that talked to me said that the, the uh, place where he was to take the remains, he said by the time they were able, to, or by the time the ground started to thaw out so they could actually start to bury people again, he said the pile of, of bodies that he was supposed to take them into uh, was about four feet tall and about a hundred yards long. Uh, so you might imagine how many, how many soldiers or remains of soldiers were just stacked uh, in, in this frozen heap. 
Um, so I have to say it was very, very uh, difficult um, in terms of, of actually burying the dead. Uh, Father Capon died on May 23rd of 1951. Uh, the ground was still frozen, and as many of you probably know, he, he died in the, the uh, death house, or what the prisoners called the death house. Uh, the North Koreans called it one of their, their camp hospitals. Um, they had three hospitals, actually, that they, that they would serve both the prisoners and the, the guards out of. Um, one of them was kind of a, disp a, dis a dispensary where they would go and if somebody needed uh, some kind of a medicine or whatever, um, they, would, they would give that medicine out, although they would never really give the medicine out to any of the prisoners. I bet it was there for the camp guards and for the people of the North Koreans and Chinese. And the second hospital was an actual kind of working hospital where if somebody was sick and that they would uh, be able to get better, they were there. Or if something happened, um, if somebody had a broken bone or something like that, they would go there and they would uh, set their bones. If somebody like had needed dental work or something, they would go there. The third one was what was the pit prisoners wound up calling the death house. It's where they would take her if it was somebody with that they knew wasn't going to live, somebody that they wanted to get rid of, they took him to this camp hospital, uh, the death house. At the death house, um, they were given very little to eat. They weren't given any medical attention, given very little water. Um, Father Capon had been sick. Uh, he had developed uh, dysentery. Um, after he been able, was able to get over the dysentery, he contracted pneumonia. Um, he had a blood clot in his leg that had caused his leg to swell up. Uh, he had some kind of an infection in one of his eyes, so um, for the last couple of months he had worn an uh, eye patch over his eye. Um, when he developed pneumonia, he started having terrible fevers. Uh, and during those last two months, or the, uh, the last month of his life anyway, uh, the fever so got, got to be so bad that he would become delirious. Um, they said that he would sleep most of the time. Oftentimes when he would be there sleeping, uh, they said he would obviously dream. And oftentimes he would dream about his family. Uh, they said that he would talk to his family members. They said that he would talk to, and they would hear him talk to his mom and dad and talk to his brother, Eugene. Uh, so that was kind of the, the state of Father Kingman's life in that, that last month of his life. Um, he did start to get better. Um, the, the fever broke and he was on, on kind of getting, uh, getting to be on mid when, be, before, before that happened. Um, the doctors, the American doctors, tried to get permission from the uh, North Koreans and Chinese to ampulate, a, amputate his leg that had the blood clot in it uh, because he thought that was what was really causing the infection that kind of ravaged his body. Uh, but they would never give him permission to do so. Um, but after a while, the, the, the fever did break and he was starting to get better. They said that he was actually starting able to sit up by himself, um, that he could carry on a conversation. Um, that it wasn't just obviously uh, him being delirious, uh, but that he could speak and carry on his conversation with others. Um, and that that is when the North Koreans and Chinese found out that he had been sick, uh, because the prisoners had try been trying to hide it from the North Korean guards, thinking that if they found this out, that they would probably take him away. Well, when they did find out that he had been sick, that's exactly what they had planned on doing. Uh, so they took him away uh, to the camp hospital or to the death house. Uh, the, the POWs that were in the same hut as him were, were close friends with, with Father Capon. Um, and when, they, when he got sick, I mean, they took him into their hut and they, like I say, they kept him trying to, they tried to keep that uh, from the, the North Koreans' uh, uh, guards. Um, so Father came and taken to the death house. We know that when he was taken to the death house, um, four of the, uh, his fellow POWs carried him up on a stretcher. Uh, one of those men was a man named Robert Woods who just passed away of, um, 
a couple of years ago. Um, he was from the St. Louis area, I think Ovala, Missouri. Um, and, and he told me that, that it was the hardest thing that he ever had to do in his life was to carry Father Caitlin on the stretcher up to the death house. Um, there were he and three others, um, and he said, they, he said all of them were just crying, had tears going down, the, the, down their faces. Um, when he was there, he said one of the most difficult things um, was that as they were going up to the death house, he said as they passed the North Korean or Chinese guards, or a couple of times when they passed the, the leaders in, in the, the POW camp, Father Capon insisted that they stop. Uh, and he said when they stopped, he said Father Capon would ask pardon of those that he had stopped by. And he said that he would ask them forgiveness for anything that he might have done that would have harmed them. Uh, and then he gave them a blessing. And he said, here he was, Father Capon, uh, giving them the, these blessings, asking forgiveness. And he said, basically, he said, what we're doing, we knew we were taking Father Cayman to his death. And the reason that he was going to die was because of these people that he was asking their pardon for. Uh, and he said it was very difficult. And he said, but as he was going along, and for the days afterwards, he said he asked himself why he was crying. Why did it elicit those, those tears? And he said, it was because he knew that they were taking Father Capon to his death. And he said he knew that he was the best, that he was the best man that probably any of them had ever or would ever meet. And he said they were taking him to die. And he said they were killing the best of us. And so he said that's why he cried. And um, so he, he tells us that that was just one of the, the most difficult things in his life um, Robert Wood is also the one, uh, one of the ones that uh, Father Capon was with uh, before they were taken prisoners and they were going up a, a mountain and, or the, they had a, a machine gun nest at the top of this, at the top of this hill uh, and they were running out of ammunition. So in an attempt to keep that hill, uh, this Robert Woods was going up this, this side of this hill and to try to take them ammunition. And Father Capon had volunteered to take ammunition up also. Uh, so Father Capon was following his Robert Woods up this hill, uh, and that's when this uh, when the sniper shot the pipe out of Father Capon's mouth. And Robert Woods said he turned around and realized that, that this sniper had done this. And he said, obviously, Father Capon was was rather sh uh, shaken, and, and he said, hey, Father, are you sure you want to go? And he says, go on, son, go on, let's get up there. And so so he, he followed him up. So anyway, this Robert Woods was a, was a close friend of uh, Father Capon, and he said that, that uh, while it was a terrible time doing, having to carry him up on the stretch to the death house, he said it was probably also one of the best things that he'd ever done for another person. Um, so Father Capon taken to the death house. Uh, when he gets to the death house, we find out that um, there was also a man there that had helped Father Capon uh, get drugs or take drugs from the hospitals to give to the American doctors. Uh, a man named William Hansen. Uh, William Hansen uh, said that they that he would go with Father Capon to. Uh, either that the hospital that was a dispensary or the hospital that was actually the working hospital. Um, and he said they would go and Father Capon would go and they would try to keep him from there. And he kept saying no, that he was going to visit, visit the sick. Um, so he would literally force his way into this hospital. And he said we would look and we would watch to see the, the people that Father Capon or that, that he, they, he would go to. And he said, they would try to figure out um, what, what, the, what the men were in there for. And he said this was more so in looking at the North Korean and Chinese guards. Uh, because he said while there were prisoners that were in there also, he said prisoners were very rarely given any medicine. Uh, but he said that they would go and they would watch. And he said if it was obviously somebody that had dysentery or obviously somebody that had some other ailment, um, 
they had watched and to see and see where they would go and get the medicine. Um, he said all of their medicine bottles were all written in Chinese, so he said nobody could read the Chinese. So he said they would figure out what somebody was suffering from, and then they would watch the doctors, the Chinese doctors, and where they would get the medicine and where they would uh, put it back, uh, so they could figure out which which drawer housed what medicine. So if it was medicine for, for dysentery, they would see them come and take it out of this drawer. So then either Father Capon or this William Hansen would, would start to cause a, a ruckus or something like that in the hospital to get everybody's attention. And the other one would go over to the, the drug cabinet and take drugs out of that drawer. So they knew they could take those drugs to the, the American doctors and say this is what they are giving people for dysentery. So they would know that they would be able to give those uh, drugs to the people for dysentery. Um, so William Hansen knew Father Capon and worked with him also. Uh, when Father Capon got to the death house, uh, William Hansen said, and William Hansen himself had been put in the death house because he had pneumonia. Uh, so at first he wasn't expected to live, but he was getting better. Uh, there in the dead house. And he said, when they brought Father Capon in, he said he recognized him right away. Um, so he went to help Father Capon, and he said the first two days, or the first day, uh, he said they brought him up, and Father Capon just rested that day. Uh, the dead house was actually a bombed out pagoda. And he said it was a big open room, and then on either side of this room, they had some small rooms that built off to uh, this main room. He said the way they worked it is that they would have drawings or little line squares on the floor. And he said each man that came into the death house was, to, was put in one of these little squares that had been marked off on the floor. And that's where they had to sleep. And so they said that they would come in and they would ring the bell at various times during the day. When it was time for everybody to get up, they would ring the bell. When it was time for them to come get food, they would ring the bell. When it was time that they were supposed to go back uh, to bed, they would ring the bell and they would have to be in this little square. Um, but one of the reasons he said they would ring the bell was in the morning that everybody had to stand up. And he said, if you didn't stand up, then they knew you were dead. Uh, so that was how they cleaned out their dread bed every morning was to ring the bell, and if you weren't standing, then you were taken to be his dead. Uh, but William Hansen said the first day, he said Father Capon came in and he just rested. Um, he said the second day, he said it was kind of a warm day. Uh, so he said that he and Father Capon went out uh, to the, the porch of this bombed out pagoda. And he said they sat out there in the sunshine and he said they were helping each other pick the lice off of each other's body. Um, the, the lice was one of the biggest problems in the POW camps. Uh, the lice would, would bite the soldiers and they, everybody, everybody suffered from having lice. Um, and they said, uh, he's, uh, Dr. Essenson told me, he said, that was one way many of the men committed suicide if they had given up hope. And he said they would just quit picking the lice off their body. Uh, he said if they did that, he said, that first day, uh, they could get by with it. Uh, he said that second day, they would start to become ashen. And he said, uh, but you, you couldn't really tell. You couldn't tell uh, yet that, that they were stopped picking off the, the lights. Uh, because he said everybody in the POW camp was ashen on, on different days. Uh, but he said that if they did, it, uh, they, uh, did not do it by the third day, he said it was too late. Uh, he said there was nothing that he or anybody else could do, uh, that they would already die, that they were going to die uh, because the lice had sucked out so much blood from their body. Um, so William Hansen said that the first day, the first full day that Father Capon was there, the two of them were out on, the, on this porch, uh, picking their lice off each other's bodies. And he said they came back in and he said Father Capon was was pretty worn out, so he said he just went back and laid down. Um, they rang the bell for them to come get their food. He said uh, usually the food was just a small bowl of rice, and that would be all that they would get for the day. Uh, so he went and he got a bowl of rice, and he brought it back and gave it to 
Father Capon. Uh, some of the guards there saw him doing that, and this was before the guards that were in the camp hospital or the death house, before they realized who Father Capon was. So they, when they saw him taking food to him, they realized that it was Father Capon. So they went and they took the food back away from Father Capon. Uh, so William Hansen tried to get him food again, but they told him no, that he couldn't give him any. Uh, and then they took Father Capon and they put him in one of these small rooms at the end of the pagoda. Uh, so they, then they took the bowl of food and they put his bowl of food there in the doorway to that, that little room. Uh, and when William Hansen tried to take him in, they told him no, that he couldn't. And they said that if he's supposed to eat, then he can get his own food. Uh, and the next day, uh, when they rang the bell for people to get up, Father King didn't, so get, didn't get up, that he had passed away in the, in, during that night. Uh, so we figured that Father Capon was there in the death house for about three days uh, before he passed away. When he passed away, uh, the guards came through and William Hansen said they pointed to him and they pointed to one other uh, prisoner and told them to go out and bury Father Capon. Uh, well, usually what would happen is they would, like to say, point to two or three prisoners. They would go and pick up the remains of whoever had died and then they would go out and one of the guards would go out with them uh, to bury the dead person. Uh, he said for some reason that night, uh, a guard didn't go with him. Uh, so he said it was just he and another man that were carrying Father Capon out. Uh, Father Capon had talked to them and told them uh, that he didn't want to be buried in one of the mass graves. Uh, so since they knew this, they just took Father Capon uh, at either end of the, the pagoda or at the end of the, the pagoda, there are a couple rows of uh, huts. On one end they used the huts for storage, on the other end they knew the huts were empty. Uh, so they took Father Capon out behind this row of empty huts. On one of them there was a lean-to. And he said they buried Father Capon underneath this lean-to. Um, like I say, it was May 23rd, he said the ground was still mostly frozen. Uh, so he said they were only able to dig down about a foot or a foot and a half. Um, so they buried Father Capon there. They knew that it was a shallow grave, so then they got rocks and put anything over his grave that they could find. And they thought that might be given, given him some protection from animals, wild animals coming through to, to take off his remains. Uh, so that's where, where Father Capon was buried. Um, not in one of the mass graves that we thought about for so long, thought he was the case for so long. Uh, we were able to find this out, or this William Hansen came and told us this, um, because he had seen Father Capon's picture on one of the Columbia magazines, the magazine of the, the, the Knights of Columbus. And it just so happened that William Hansen had Hansen had retired to Naples, Florida. Um, William Hansen's story is kind of interesting in itself. Um, after he got out of the Korean War, the army made him stay in the or made him, made him stay in the army for another three years, and they told him that they were doing this uh, because they wanted to make sure that he was healthy enough or that he wasn't suffering from any um, long-term effects from the from the POW camp. For some reason, after William Hansen was released from the army, they made him sign a paper saying that he would never, never divulge any information from the POW camps. And we don't know, nobody knows why this was done, because no other POWs were required to do this. But for some reason, they had William Hansen sign this paper. So he never did. He never told anybody about any of this. Um, he had, was originally from New York City. Uh, he drove a bus up and down Broadway. So he spent his life going up and down Broadway, to, uh, driving the bus. Uh, when he finally retired to uh, Naples, Florida, 
uh, he started having some health issues. And some of these issues were that he started having nightmares again from the POW camps. All of the POWs had nightmares, and all of them, they, all of the POWs still have nightmares. Uh, one, one of the POWs that I talked to, that, uh, that Dr. Sidney Essenston, uh, when I went to visit him, uh, the first thing he told me was that he hasn't been able to sleep with his wife for 50 years. And my first thought was, well, too much information, I don't want to hear this. Um, but, uh, so he explained, he said, Father, he said, I have nightmares. And he said, if I try to sleep with my wife, she wakes up with bruises. And it's because of his thrashing about at night. Uh, well, William Hansen had nightmares also. Uh, but he said after about 10 years of being, or about 10 years after the war, his nightmares started to get fewer and fewer. And he said it finally got so that he might have two or three nightmares a month. Uh, but when he moved to Florida, he said things changed. And he said they started to be more frequent. And it said it got to be about two or three times a week. And he went to a doctor. And when, when he was in New York, the health care for the working for the city of New York was good enough that he never had to do anything with the VA. So he never had to. Um, take the services of the VA before. When he got to, to Florida, he went to the doctor, was telling him some of his difficulties, and the doctor asked him if he had been in the military. And he said, yeah. And the doctor said, well, you need to go to the VA, because he said, the VA doctors will be able to help treat you much better than I can. So he went to the VA. Um, he said there was a problem. Uh, with, with his uh, army records. Uh, so he said they had some difficulty finding him to uh, finding his records uh, so that he might be able to go to the VA. He said finally he was able to go and he said he was there in the waiting room and that's where he saw this Columbia magazine. <clears throat> uh, there was a picture of Father Cayman on the front of the magazine because it was an article about the Diocese of Wichita uh, starting to investigate his life for possible sainthood. Uh, so that was the issue that was there in the waiting room. And as a matter of fact, that issue, when he saw it, was probably about a year and a half old. Uh, so that's why all of the magazines you see in doctor's offices are so old. But so, so that when this happened, William Hansen could see it. Uh, so anyway, he picked up this magazine, and when he, when he went in to see the doctor, um, he explained the situation to the doctor, and he said, do you suppose it would be all right if I would tell these people that I buried him? And the doctor said, well, why wouldn't it be? And he explained about having to sign this thing. And the, the doctor said, he said, it's 50 years since the Korean War was over. He said, why would you think they would even care whether or not you'd do this? And he said, what are they gonna do? Put you in prison after all this time? Um, so he gave us a call, he gave me a call and told me that he had, had buried Father Capon. Uh, so this is the first inkling that we had, that Father Capon wasn't in one of these mass graves. Um, I had been working with a guy from the, the Department of Defense, whose name was Phil O'Brien. Um, it was his job to try to identify everybody that had died in the prison camp. Um, we know that about 1,600 men died in this prison camp, and thus far, this fellow Ryan had been able to identify about 1,400 of them. He said that the remaining 200 he thought were probably going to be men that they will never identify because when he had signed this agreement not to say anything, he had not told anything, even to his wife. And she said, I am so mad at him she said, you'll see. She said, he has things that he's hidden from me for 50 years. And she said, I want to know where he's hidden them. Because she said, I want to find out what else is there. And she said, he won't tell me where they're at. So anyway, so I talk, started talking to William Hansen. And like I say, all of his news was new. I mean, we had not known any of this before. So he told the story about him being there in the death house with Father Cayman. 
Um, he had told the story about, about uh, uh, how he had buried Father Capon and that it was not among the mass graves, that it was uh, buried, they buried him near the death house, just behind these, these huts. Um, so in, in another amazing thing that he had, the, the, what, what his wife was talking about, he had a box of paperwork or papers that came from the, the POW camp. And I have no idea how he got them out of the POW camp because they said, uh, for the most part, they would not let people carry anything out. So I don't know if he patterned his clothes with these things or not, but um, when they opened up the POW camps in 1950 and in 1951, the North Koreans were in charge of the POW camps. When the uh, Chinese got involved in the war, and the Chinese started to see how poorly the men were treated in the POW camps, they started to be afraid of what was going to happen after the war was over, because they were afraid of what the rest of the world was going to say when they had these prison camps, and so many of the men died because they weren't given any aid whatsoever. So the Chinese started to uh, begin a propaganda campaign. And while they, they did treat the POWs somewhat better, it was still atrocious how they treated them. But one of the things they did in this propaganda campaign was they organized a prison Olympics. And they would have these, these Olympics were held in prison camp number five. So they would have uh, prisoners from other POW camps come to prison camp number five and they would do, have athletic games. And this William Hansen had pamphlets from these Olympics. And I was amazed, I mean, I had never heard of it before. And I thought, this is kind of strange. But no, when I talked to this fellow Brian about it, he said, yes. He said, that's exactly what the, the Chinese did. And they did it to try to make it seem like they were doing stuff for the prisoners to try to be more humane uh, so that they would not have the backlash after the war. So as it turned out, and I told them about what William Hansen said, and it just so happened that probably about six months before I started talking to this, this fellow Brian, uh, there had been another POW, a man named Sergeant Lusk. Sergeant Les died about three months after Father Capon. And they know that Sergeant Les had been charged to clean at the death house. Um, and they know that when he was buried, that he was not buried in one of the, the mass graves, but that he was buried someplace else. And they, they told, or they, they knew who had buried him, so they gave him and uh, told them about where he was and when he was buried. And so Phil O'Brien remembered this, and he realized that where I was describing that they had buried Father Cainman would have been very close to where Father or this Sergeant Lusk was buried. So he figured that if Sergeant Lusk had been identified, and that, that Father Cainman's body would have been near where Father or this Sergeant Lusk was buried. So he thought if Sergeant Lusk's uh, remains had come back to the United States that Father Capons probably had also. Um, after the war in 1954, when all of these remains were returned to the United States, those that were not identified were buried in the Post Bowl or the National Cemetery in Honolulu, Hawaii. And they were just buried in individual graves as a, a tomb of the unknown soldier. Um, so that is how this Sergeant Lusk uh, made it to Hawaii. That's ultimately how Father Capon made it to Hawaii. Was that they are both buried um, there in the punch bowl as unknown soldiers. So I'd like to say it's been, it's probably been about seven or eight years ago that the remains for Sergeant Lusk were identified. So Phil O'Brien was the one that told me that he believed that Father Capon was in Hawaii. Um, the way they work it, or at the time I was told the way they work it, was the Department of Defense still actively tries to identify these remains, uh, but they do it with just a lottery system. 
so that each year uh, they will just pull out great numbers of, of unknown soldiers and they would exhume them and they would try to identify them. Uh, the difficulty is, is they still have remains from uh, people that died during World War II, also people that died during the Vietnam War, as well as Korea. Uh, so there's many remains that they try to identify. Um, so Phil O'Brien said it may very well just be a matter of time before they identify Father Caitlin's remains. I know there were a couple times, well, uh, well, at that time, Phil O'Brien said that I might be able to contact, uh, he said that, that they had two graduate students that were there working for, on uh, research projects there at the Punch Bowl. Uh, so he said I might be able to contact them. The government could not do anything but this lottery system. They, they could not uh, just, they, they could not look for anybody specific because of a conflict of interest or the, the illusion of somebody paying them to, to find their, their loved one or whatever. Uh, but it, they told me that there were these two assistants that are uh, graduate assistants doing work there that might be able to help us out. Um, but then they, we started dealing with the Medal of Honor, uh, so I never got around to, to even speaking to these two assistants. Um, so anyway, the, the thought of Father Caitlin's remains being found or coming to us had been on the back burner. I mean, it's something that we'd always hoped for. About six months ago, I started to wonder if there wasn't some way that we could make arrangements or to see if they couldn't redo their efforts or whatever to find the remains of Father Caitlin. Um, so when the phone call came, uh, they, they contacted Ray Caitlin, who was Father Caitlin's nephew. Uh, he's kind of the spokesperson for the family. Uh, so they called him up, informed him first, and then Ray called me up uh, to tell me that they had found the remains. Uh, they had actually found the remains, or identified the remains, last December. And they'd been working all this time from December until the 1st of March, trying to make sure that it was Father Caitlin. Um, they are 100% sure that, that it is Father Caitlin. In 1954, when they buried the remains of the unknown soldiers, uh, they would take the remains and they would dip them in a solution. And they thought they were doing this to help preserve the, the re remains. Um, while it may have preserved them, but it also killed off the DNA. Uh, so they weren't able to do any 100% matches, DNA matches. Uh, <clears throat> but as they were, or in the last year or so, or a couple years, they have developed a method in which they could take the shaving of the bone, uh, and from that shaving of the bone, they could dip it into another solution that would draw out the DNA uh, and reconstruct the DNA. Uh, so that's how they were able to do it. So between that uh, partial DNA um, and dental records, uh, they said that they are 100% sure that these remains are from Kings. One of the most amazing things about this is he also said that of his remains, that I'm assuming skeletal remains that they're talking about, um, they said that of, of those remains, they said that Father Caitlin's remains are about 95% complete, which is unheard of. Uh, when uh, uh, the, these remains that were returned um, from the North Koreans, they were all put together in, in larger boxes. I mean, that none of them were, very few of them were individual coffins or individual boxes. And they said even those, they said usually what would happen is they would have maybe a, a skeleton and then there might be some arm bones or whatever from another person that were tossed in there, or the, the, the skeleton was actually pieces of many different people that were put together uh, when they were gathering and putting them together as, as remains. Um, so the fact that they're 95% complete are all, is also amazing. Um, so they will return the remains to the Caitlin family. 
uh, the Capon family is, is working with the diocese, and uh, one of the first things that happens when we start, when you start a, a uh, investigation of somebody's life for Satan, is the, the Vatican requires that you make sure that their remains are in a secure place. Uh, so if, if we had Father Capon's remains when this started, we would have required, the bishop would have been required to go to his grave site. And if there was a chance that that, that grave site could be uh, broken into or, or stolen, uh, then his, remain, his remains would have had to have been exhumed and taken to a place of safety. Uh, so that's one of the things that the Vatican will assist, insist upon is that to be taken and, uh, and uh, buried in a secure place. Uh, one, I mean, the main reason for it is to re prevent uh, grave robbers. I mean, with, with those who are, are saints uh, or being considered for saints, their, their graves would be robbed uh, for people to gain relics. Um, so we know that that's the case. The family understands that. Uh, so they'll be they'll be talking with the bishop, and then we'll be be making plans on where it can go. Originally, I was told that if uh, or the the army is working with the family and have assured them that they do not have to hurry this process. Um, so one of the things that they might do is take Father Caton's remains and take them to Arlington Cemetery and have him secured in, in there at Arlington Cemetery until the family decides where he will be interred. Uh, and then from uh, Arlington Cemetery, then bring him back to Kansas if that's where he's to be. So we don't, we don't know for sure yet uh, how that is all going to unfold, um, but the, the family is working towards that and, and, and getting things in, in proper order and things. Uh, so that's all news yet to come, things that we don't really know, know how it will unfold yet. I think the family will have them brought back here to Kansas. Um, there are some, some of the POWs that are still alive are kind of pushing for the family to have them buried, be buried. Uh, there is a section in Arlington Cemetery uh, for chaplains, um, and they think that would be a more fitting place for him, but I, I don't think the family will go for that. I think they want him back home. Uh, so that's kind of, the process of how we got to this point in time. So, so I didn't know if you have any questions or anything about that, or actually anything, any questions about Father Caitlin or his cause or anything going on? Yeah. So, so what is your um, role in all of this? How did that all start? Um, my title is the Episcopal Delegate. Uh, basically, I'm the, the, the bishop's delegate in, in promoting his cause for canonization. Um, back in, well, uh, it's all my mom's fault. My, <laughs> my mom has always had a devotion to Father Caper. Um <clears throat> Growing up, uh, there were, I, I have, there, there's nine kids in my family. Um, growing up, uh, we grew up in the southeast Wichita, and uh, there was, half we grew up in, there was one, one full bathroom and one half bath upstairs. Um, but uh, the full bathroom on the, the medicine cabinet, my mom had taken her cards and on one corner of the medicine cabinet, there was a prayer card for Father Caitlin, and being who we are on the other side was a prayer card for St. Jude, since we are all hopeless causes. But, uh, <laughs> so, so, growing up, I mean, this, this is what we got to look at every morning were these two prayer cards. Um, but anyway, she did have a devotion to Father Caitlin. Um, I claim Father Capon's first miracle for myself uh, was that when I was going to Catholic University uh, to study canon law, uh, I prayed for Father Capon's intercession often. 
Father Capon also went to Catholic University between the Second World War and Korea. Um, but while I've always done the writing school, it's never been my favorite thing. So I would often pray for Father Capon's intercession to get me through school. Uh, and so I figured it might be Father Capon calling for paybacks or whatever also. Uh, but uh, uh, when Bishop Carroll or when Bishop Gerber was bishop, he's the one that ordained me. And uh, after I got my degree in canon law, I told him that if they ever decided to pursue Father Capon's canonization, uh, since one of the things that would be required would be a canon law degree, um, that I would be happy to help out uh, in, in this process. Well, Bishop Gerber always thought that it should be rest in the military's hands to do this since he was a chaplain when he died. Uh, so when Bishop Olmsted took over for Bishop Gerber, when Bishop Gerber retired, uh, Bishop Olmsted uh, asked me if I would start to investigate his life uh, to see whether or not the diocese should pursue it. So I started to look into things, and at the same time, uh, he appointed me as judicial vicar for the diocese and also pastor at St. Mary's up in Newton. Uh, so Father Cayman's stuff always had to be third, or the, took the, the last place and uh, uh, be below the other two assignments. So it was something that I could work on if I had free time. Um, actually, it was the, I had an appointment with Bishop Olmsted. Uh, and he was supposed, or I was going to tell him that, that I had found no reason for us not to pursue Father Caitlin's cause. What I had done is I, I thought, well, you know, the easiest way to go about doing this would be to see if I could find any dirt on Father Caitlin. And because if I found something that he had done that was terrible, it would be, well, there's no point in looking to him as a saint when he done this. So I was trying to take the easy way out. and. I could never find anybody that said anything bad about Father Caitlin or ever do anything bad. Um, so I had talked to several of the POWs, had talked to quite a few people that he grew up with. Uh, so I had an appointment with Bishop Olmsted on a Thursday. Well, at that time, um, the Vatican would announce new bishops on, for the United States on Tuesdays. They had always, these announcements would always be made at noon in Rome on Tuesdays. So that meant that it would be either six in the morning or seven in the morning, depending on whether or not we were in daylight savings time, would be when announcements for bishops would be made in the United States. Well, the Tuesday of the week that I had the appointment with Bishop Olmsted, they announced that Bishop Olmsted had been appointed past or Bishop of Phoenix. Uh, the moment he was appointed as Bishop of Phoenix, he was no longer Bishop of Wichita. He was the Apostolic Administrator. Um, one of the things that the, the Apostolic Administrator cannot start anything new in that diocese. Um, so that meant Bishop Olmsted couldn't make that decision as to whether or not we started the, the, to uh, investigate his life. So um, it wound up being about a year and a half uh, before Bishop Jacobs was appointed bishop. Uh, so we waited for that year and a half. After that, uh, I mean, I was still doing uh, a more investigation. Um, after that, uh, I gave Bishop Jacobs about six months before I approached him and talked to him about what we were going to do with Father Capon. And he said, yes, that will pursue it. Uh, so then we first hired a postulator over in Rome. Uh, that took about another six months. Um, and then with the postulator coming on board, uh, I was appointed as the Episcopal Delegate. So I was the one that was, kind of, that was supposed to run the investigation so that we had to kind of do everything that I'd done again because it was the beginning of, of the, the, the official opening of his cause. Um, so we, 
mysteriously open Father Keeping's cards for seated on June 29th of 2008. Um, and we officially closed our work on July 1st of 2011. Uh, that's when we sent all of the, the information over to Rome, the 16,000 pages of documents that we sent to Rome. So, that continues. Now, now we're doing, um, working with alleged miracles and other things that Rome requests of us. So, yeah. As of now, um, the congregation, or the, for each cause, they have to hold at least one public meeting. And that's a meeting in which anybody can approach the congregation for saints, and if anybody has any reason for somebody not to be canonized, they speak their mind then, or if they have stuff that they would like to present that the congregation may not know, they can do it at that time also. Um, Father Caitlin's public meeting was scheduled for March of last year, like you say. Uh, unfortunately, it was scheduled for the day after everything closed down because of COVID. Um, they have yet to start having public meetings again. While they have started working at the Congregation for Saints, I know they, they said that, that in this time that they've reopened, that Rome was literally closed down maybe like five or six times again uh, because of threats from the COVID and stuff. So they have yet to um, they have yet to officially schedule any of these public meetings. So it is supposed to be forthcoming. And if something like that would happen in maybe April, I might not be surprised, <laughs> but I don't know that, so, <laughs> so it, it, is, it is supposed to come soon, so. At this public meeting, what they will do is the, the cardinals, and one of the reasons why it does take them time to get these meetings together is they do have a panel of archbishops and cardinals. Uh, that would be assigned to, to the cases. Um, and what their job will be is to what to uh, decide whether or not Father Caven, or whether or not they should recommend to the Pope that Father Caven be given the name Venerable. Once he's given the name Venerable, is when they'll start to do work on the alleged miracles. We have all of the information for one of the alleged miracles over there now. Um, we have paperwork on two other alleged miracles still here in the diocese. We're still a little bit of work to do on those um, if, they, if they need them. Uh, but if this first alleged miracle is accepted, uh, then they, they will, that will open the way for him to be beatified and receive the title blessing. So, but they won't start that until after he's named venerable. He said the same thing. 
it seems like whenever something happened or whenever you got bogged down on something, that all of a sudden things just happened. And that's really the way it's been with me in, in this whole process. All through this process, for the work on Father Kingman's cause has had to take third, third place for me. Because when I was first assigned judicial vicar, uh, pastor at St. Mary's, uh, so those always had to take precedence over doing that work. Even after we had, had uh, officially opened this cause in, in 2008, um, I still had two other jobs that had to take place in front of it. Uh, even, I mean, when we were, were doing it, I mean, I wasn't me at St. Mary's anymore, but I was at the Colonel Air Force Base uh, and still judicial vicar. I, I was able to quit being judicial vicar right after I came here. Um, and, and, uh, but, so I can say all, all this was, had to come before my work on Father Caven. Yet, things got bad. Uh, when I would talk to other people that are working on other causes uh, in the United States, they were not able to believe that we were able to get the work that we had done when basically we had no paid staff. I mean, everything was done with volunteers. Um, uh, with, with me being in, in, in charge of it, uh, I mean, my salary always came from either the parish that I was working at or from the tribunal. Um, so all of this was done with, with volunteer work, and yet it all got done. Um, I am convinced, I mean, even, even um, like with the Medal of Honor, uh, when he received the Medal of Honor in 2013, um, yeah, I was able to, to provide some information to the Army and stuff from it, but the bulk of that work was done by a man named Bill, Bill Latham, um, who was, uh, at that time, he was an instructor up at West Point. Um, and he was writing a book on the, um, uh, I'm trying to, uh, what is it? Uh, the, the title of his book escapes me right now, but it, but it was a book on the Korean, the American prisoners in Korean War POW camps. And so he came to know a father came through that. And uh, he helped the family uh, put together uh, the, the first request for Father Kagan to be awarded the Medal of Honor um, back in like 2005 to begin with. And it would just got set back and set back and set back. And, and finally, things just fell into place for him to receive the Medal of Honor. Um, so, I mean, it happened. And it happened at a very opportune time. And I think that's the same thing with its finding of its remains. I, all of this, I think, is being done in God's time. And I'm convinced that that's all just a sign of, of that he is called to be named a saint. Um, when I started doing this work, um, we have notebooks that are full of his homilies. Um, he, some of his homilies, probably about, I don't know, um, about six months of his homilies, we have it as handwritten homilies that he had wrote out. We have another year full of, of them that, where, they're, where they're typed out and stuff. But we have all of those that were saved for some reason. We have uh, notebooks full of his, his class notes from Conception Seminary and from, from uh, Kendrick Seminary. Uh, when I first started to do it, one of the things that we had to do was somebody had to read through everything that he'd ever written to make sure that it was doctrinally sound. So I got a, a, together a, a historical committee to start, or the theological committee to start doing this. And, and I had all of these notebooks, and I just assumed that they were class notes, or the stuff the instructors gave out. And he said that Father Capon would take notes in class, and then he would go back and he would type them up. And then after he typed them up, he would have mimeograph copies made, and he said he would let all of us use them as a study guide so that we could use them to study with in high school or in school, uh, both in the seminary and also in the college seminary. So he said, we have all of these things. And he said, 
those are Trafalgar Father Caitlin's handwritten notes. And I thought, great, that means however many, many, many more things for people to read. Uh, but, but we have all of that stuff. Why, why would any of that have been saved but for this purpose? I don't know. So, I can say so many things like that have happened. Uh, it's just, just amazing. So. You were at the Medal of Honor presentation, I understand? Yeah. Could you speak to that just a bit? Yeah. Um, it was... I, I don't know that I've ever said that there was a time when I thought President Obama did perfect, but it would have been that day. Um, <laughs> The, the whole the whole time was and the, the army has it down pat. Um, the the whole process was amazing. Um, I'm trying to think. It would have been in December of 2012. Um, I was at I'd gone into the chancery office and I'd gotten there a, a little bit later than what I usually, usually did. I went down to the the tribunal office and. Um, I got a phone call um, from the bishop, and he, he said, get to my office now. And I thought, great, this, this is good news when I first walked in. Um, so I go up there to his office, and in his office there was a, um, somebody in full dress clothes, a major, a major, and then a woman that was with him. Um, uh, who was very nicely dressed and stuff like that, and I thought, I have no idea what's going on. Um, so they came and uh, wanted to inform Bishop Jacobs and myself that Father Capon was going to be awarded. Well, before that, they asked both of us, and we had to answer separately so that they could document the answers, that we would not divulge any information that was talked about that day. Uh, to anybody. And so I looked at the bishop, and so the bishop said, sure. So I said, sure. And uh, <laughs> so then they told us that uh, Father Capon was going to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And at this time, his sister-in-law, Helen, uh, was still alive. And <laughs> this was... Um, <coughs> they had called up Helen, or no, Helen, Helen Cayman was living in assisted living up at the Spiritual Life Center, and uh, trying to remember how, the, how this was set. Um, she had a daughter that would come by almost every day to help her out and do things. She got a call one day, and they said that she would receive a phone call from the President of the United States at such and such a time the next day. And they wanted to know if she would be available. And she thought it was somebody making a joke. Right. So she just said, I was sure, and hung up. And so the next day, um, she got a call from the President of the United States. And he said who it was. and. She thought it was somebody joking with her, so she hung up. <laughs> and, and then, uh, so they sent, uh, or so the next time they called, uh, her daughter was there. So they spoke to her daughter, and they said that they've been trying to speak to Helen, and the President of the United States would like to speak to her. And so her daughter said, well, I'll make sure that she's here. So they called again. At that time, they made sure that she, that she was there. So her daughter was there. And um, so she took the call. When they started speaking to her, they said the first thing they said to her was that they could only talk to her if she agreed not to tell anybody this. And so she agreed to it and they told her that father the president said that he would like to award Emil Capon the medal of honor um, 
So she said, well, that would be good. And uh, so then she finished talking to him. She hung up. And then her daughter said, well, what did he say? And she says, I'm not telling. <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't tell. She wouldn't tell anybody in her family. So there was Helen Capon, the bishop and me were the three people here that knew that he was going to get the Medal of Honor. And they told us that they would let us know when we could announce it. So all this going on, and the way they, they do it is they wait to announce the upcoming, or the upcoming Medal of Honor until the presentation of the Medal of Honor for the previous one has been done. Well, they had two people that needed to be awarded the Medal of Honor before Father Capon. Um, so that meant it would be at least two months before they would give us this, this green light. So, um, but then something came up with one of those. So it had to be put off for another month. So it wound up being three months that the bishop and I knew about it. And it got to be a real pain because it got so that uh, every day the bishop would come down to my office and say, can I tell him yet? Can I tell him yet? <laughs> So anyway, so we finally got approval to tell. When they make, they do the, Amer the uh, Medal of Honor ceremonies, it takes place in the White House. Um, and then the next day they have a, a presentation at the Pentagon uh, in which they are enrolled in the Hall of Heroes. Um, so at the, the, the room at the White House would hold 325 people. So. The White House would invite 100 people, the Army would invite 100 people, and then the family could invite 100 people. So uh, the family asked me if I would go on and, and make arrangements for the 100 people. So we were able to get, there were nine of the POWs that were able to go. Um, and then different officials, different family members. Um, uh, so we got all of that settled up, settled. For all the ones that came, we had to, to give them some number from like a, a driver's license, we had to give them a social security number, uh, their date of birth, and that's, they could do the background check. There could not be one letter of any name that was different than what was on the uh, documents they had. We had one, one lady from, from uh, 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 Pilsen that was going, and her name was Carol, C-A-R-O-L-E. Well, when they were doing her, the information for her, somebody left the E off. And when we got up there to do it, when she was checking in, they weren't gonna let her in. The only, the only way that they let her in was because they were able to get a hold of um, the, Ken, or the driver's license records here in the United States, or here in Kansas, to confirm the fact that it should have been C-A-R-O-L-E. Uh, so that was the only reason. Um, that she got in. Um, so when they, they have you come up and they ask that you all stay in one hotel, uh, so it was a hotel um, and uh, what they do is they bring a bus to take you to the White House. Uh, you go through a metal security or a metal detector before you get on the bus. Um, once you get on the bus, it's a a motorcade that takes you through Washington, D.C. So if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and been stopped by one of these motorcades with the long line of traffic and stuff behind you, uh, that was that was us. We got away from that. <laughs> to all these people have to stop. You get to the, the, the White House. Uh, then you go through another metal detector at the White House. And then you go through a, a room um, that's probably, oh, it was probably six foot square. And on both sides of the room, it's all just grates. I mean, uh, like a, a furnace grate type things. Well, you can't see it when you're going through the room, but when you get to the other side, you can turn back around and see on one side, they have fans blowing towards these grates. And on the other side, they have police, police officers and guard dogs. And they're there, the dogs are there sniffing as you walk through to see if there's any 
anything for a bomb or any contraband. Uh, so then you get in there. Um, they have a reception for you in the, this, I, mean, I think they just called it the Great Hall. Um, but it's this, this room and they have portraits of all of the presidents uh, around it. Um, they served, um, they didn't serve Dr. Pepper. They, <laughs> they served champagne and beer. Uh, and then had some hors d'oeuvres. Um, but everybody that was there, I mean, they'd be running around and standing underneath their favorite president or whatever to get their picture taken. Um, so you had all of these army officials that were there also, um, all of these, I mean, senators and things like that that were attending the ceremonies. Um, then they had you, the, uh, go, took you into the room. Um, some of the people that I had to make arrangements for to go there were press people from here in Wichita. Um, they had me designate one person that would be a photographer, and that photographer could not be among the other guests. And when you went into this room where they were making the presentation, they had like a stockade thing at the back of the room. And when you first went in, that was empty. And then they opened it up uh, for the prep for the photographers to come in and this this space was probably about oh, Probably about six feet wide by about oh, maybe 20 25 feet long and That was filled up just in an instant all of these photographers were in there and they were crammed uh, I mean just crammed together um, And then you'd hear them with their cameras starting to, to click off or to take pictures and stuff the moment the president made his way into that room, the, the noise from the cameras was just amazing. It, it sounded like you were in a, a tin-roofed building where, where rain was coming down. Because it was just click, 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 click. All, and that lasted the whole time. The whole time that the presentation was being made. Um, so um, President Obama made the presentation, his, his nephew came up, um, and then after the presentation was over, the thing that amazed that I was so impressed with was that Obama called off the, the called out the, the names of the POWs and he asked them to go out with him. And so they went out one door and everybody else was taken out the other. Well, when he was there with the POWs, he greeted everyone in the he and his wife greeted everyone in the POWs. They all had an opportunity to have their picture taken uh, with, with the president, um, and he, he did he did right by the POWs. And as far as I was concerned, that was the best thing he could possibly do. Um, so then we went to a, a reception. Michelle Obama can do a mean beef tenderloin. Let me tell you. <laughs> It, it was it was a reception. I mean, the food there was fantastic. Everything was fantastic. Uh, they had told me before that the, the reception could go on for however long, and uh, um, so I said to him, I said, "Well, do I need to tell people that they need to start leaving?" And they said, "We'll take care of it." And the the reception took place. In, there were three rooms: the the red, green, and blue rooms. They said those are rooms that are not open to the general public ever. And um, I mean, so everything was laid out there and everybody was, was having a good time. Well, I looked and it was getting to be time for us to, for them to be closing up stuff. And, and all of a sudden, there were about five or six White House staff that came in and they just started at one end of the room and they would go along and they would start to chat with people. And as they were chatting with people, they kept walking and, and kept walking and they would kind of take people's empty plates from them and they kind of set them off to the side and, and just walk and talk along with them more all the way going along and within five minutes all, all the rooms were clear and nobody realized that they were being kicked out. <laughs> so, so, so it, it was a very, uh, it, was, it was a perfect day and the next day they had it at the, the, the Pentagon. Um, if anybody tells you that the Pentagon is a huge place, don't believe them because it's twice as big as that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it goes on forever and ever. Um, when we got there, I, they asked me to come. 
uh, the day before because uh, they wanted me to be there to check out where they were doing the presentations and I had to do an interview there. Um, when I got there, I mean, we walked forever to get to where they were having this and, and they had us come through the visitor's entrance and I told them, I said, there's guys that aren't going to be able to do this. I said, the, the POWs, I said, there's no way that they're going to be able to walk this. And so they said, well, we'll see what we can do. Um, so that day, what they did was they opened up, instead of having everybody come through the visitor's entrance, um, they opened up an entrance that was on the other side of the, of the Pentagon. The visitor's entrance was on one side, so what, what we were originally going to have to do is walk through all the offices and then walk through the courtyard and to the other side of the Pentagon. Um, but that day they allowed us, they opened up doors on the other side of the, the Pentagon so they were able to take everybody in carts around the Pentagon to the other entrances so that it was, so they wound up having to walk about 300 yards as opposed to however many miles it would have been. <laughs> But no, it was it was fantastic. The the army personnel and stuff were spot on. I mean, I can't think of anything that could have gone better. So, all very good. I didn't steal anything, so you can't. <laughs> I don't have any mementos. So. They, they did tell me that, that um, when, when somebody, is, uh, somebody that is living is awarded the Medal of Honor, uh, they give him two. They have one for them to preserve uh, and also one that they can wear. When, um, uh, when a Medal of Honor recipient goes into any military function, the minute they walk into the room, everybody is to stop and everybody is to stand. All military personnel are to stop and to stand to honor them. Um, when it is somebody like Father Capon, who was awarded the Medal of Honor posthumously, then they only give the, they give the family one Medal of Honor. Um, the Medal of Honor is off. The Medal of Honor is made by Tiffany. Um, uh, but they said that they know that that some of them have been sold on the black market in upwards of four million dollars. So the one Father Capons is up in Pilsen, and uh, it's kept in a safe a safe deposit box at the bank there, and then they bring it out for special occasions. But that also is officially the families. So. so anyway, it's been it's been a fun time. It continues to be fun. Although people don't understand when I say this, but the Bishop Bishop Jacobs commented something something about or one time about me going to Rome and I said I said if it's gonna to take me going to Rome or if, it's, if, if I'm going to re, be required to go to Rome for him to be named a saint, then he can hang it up now because I ain't doing it. <laughs> been, been there, done that. I've been to Rome in the 1980s and it was enough for me. And, and I, I told him I'd much rather be celebrating Mass here in Wichita than, than putting up with the crowds and stuff like that in Rome while it was going on. So. Let me go up to Pilsen. Let me do something here. So, yeah. William Punches, yes, he does. Um, actually, his, his uh, uh, he lives in Clemson, uh, South Carolina, and um, he has a little, just a little um, shadow box that he has stuff from the. the UW camp. Um, he had, well, he has that Bible, but he keeps that Bible with him. Uh, the other stuff, I mean, he has a, like a wooden cone uh, that, they, that they gave out. He has a, a, a wooden spoon that they used at the PW camp. Um, 
one that they, they confiscated most of the things that the prisoners had. And even like the crucifix that is at Cape and Mount Carmel High School now. Um, no, I, I don't have this confirmed. And the people that would have smuggled it out of the POW camp have all died, so I don't know. And their, their family members don't know. Um, I don't know how they got that crucifix out because they searched everybody that was leaving the POW camp um, for that, that stuff. And um, like with William Funches, uh, he said there was one time that he had to drop that Bible in the latrine uh, to keep them from finding it. And he had to go back to the latrine later on to, to dig it out. Um, but like on this crucifix, the best that I can find out on that, that crucifix, if you look at it, um, the corpus is made with different pieces and the arms will are different from the body. Um, some of the POWs told me that the only way that they could get stuff out was if they would hide things in bandages. That the North Koreans and Chinese would not take off a bandage or look at a bandage because they were afraid of what they would see or what, would, what they might catch. Um, so some of the guards said they thought that they were smuggled out in people's bandages. Um, so whether or not that is the case, I don't know for sure. Uh, but that's, that's the only, the best I can come up with for like having crucifix. But a, no, a number of them have said that that's how they were able to get things out of the POW camp. That William Funches, um, uh, his story about leaving the POW camp when they were let release the prisoners after the war, they would come up in trucks and they would read off names. And if your name was uh, read off, then you got in that truck and they took you to the switch where they were exchanging prisoners. Um, William Funches' name was never, never read off. So he was one of the last, he said there were about 10 of them that were in the last, or in the, the POW camp. And so he asked why, when he got to go, and they told him that he wasn't going. Um, because he was brought up on charges, uh, or um, uh, on war crimes. Uh, and they said that he would have to, to uh, face charges on war crimes. Well, what they had gotten him for was he was when he was captured uh, where he was captured he witnessed the North Koreans killing other North Koreans and then they, they said that it was to, due to an attack from the United Nations forces that these that, that they died um, and William Funch stood up and said no that it was North Koreans that killed these North Koreans and because of that he was brought up on charges of war crimes uh, so they told him he wasn't going to go. So when they told him that, he just went and he said that he hid on the back of the truck. Um, and he got out that way. And he said when they were taking him, he said the truck stopped, uh, told him to get out, of the, uh, get out of the truck, and they told him to start walking. And he said there was just a little path through these fields. And he said he started walking that field, and he figured that he was going to be shot in the back. And he said he made it to the other part of the field and then he started running. Uh, and he said that eventually he heard noise and it was the American troops that he heard. So he made it to the American troops where he probably would have been killed. So, yeah. But to think that they, the things they went through and they're still alive is amazing. Yeah. Do you know how long the ones that, one that survived was in there? For how long they were in all, all of these that I know um, uh, were, were have been in the prison camp for three years for the duration of the war. This William Funches, when he was captured, um, he would have arrived. Um, Father Capon would have been captured on November 2nd of 1950. William Funches was probably captured in December of 1950 and probably made it to the POW camp in January of 51. Um, but all, most, let's see, 
all of the ones that I've interviewed that were, would have been there for the duration of the war. Since, I mean, within, within five or six months of the war, uh, or of the, yeah, within five or six months of December of 1950. The man that carved the crucifix of Father Capon, of uh, the one that said Capon of Carmel, uh, he actually didn't get there until a year after Father Capon had died. And when he was asked about the crucifix, uh, he was a Jew, uh, a man named uh, Fink. Uh, uh, and uh, when he was captured, uh, he whittled uh, to pass the time. And some of the, the POWs approached him and asked if he would do something of uh, Father Capon did. He had never seen Father Capon, uh, but he told stories. And uh, when he carved this crucifix, uh, they asked him how he knew what Jesus would have looked like. And he said, that's not Jesus. He said, that's Father Capon. Anything else? One of the Father Capon's favorite things to do, or one of the things that he encouraged people to do, was to pray the Hail Mary, and not just one, but three Hail Marys. So, how about if we close tonight by reciting three Hail Marys? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, O woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, O woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou, O woman, and blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Father, take it, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.